Chapter 10 of the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olauda Equiano. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mons Bru, Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 10 of the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olauda Equiano by Olauda Equiano. Chapter 10. The author leaves Dr. Irving and engages on board a Turkey ship. Account of a black man's being kidnapped on board and sent to the West Indies, and the author's fruitless endeavors to procure his freedom. Some account of the manner of the author's conversion to the faith of Jesus Christ. Our voyage to the North Pole being ended, I returned to London with Dr. Irving, with whom I continued for some time, during which I began seriously to reflect on the dangers I had escaped particularly those of my last voyage, which made a lasting impression on my mind, and by the grace of God proved afterwards a mercy to me. It caused me to reflect deeply on my eternal state, and to seek the Lord with full purpose of heart, ere it was too late. I rejoiced greatly, and heartily thanked the Lord for directing me to London, where I was determined to work out my own salvation, and in so doing, procure a title to heaven, being the result of a mind blended my ignorance and sin. In process of time I left my master, Dr. Irving, the purifier of waters, and lodged in Coventry Court Haymarket, where I was continually oppressed and much concerned about the salvation of my soul, and was determined, in my own strength, to be a first-rate Christian. I used every means for this purpose, and, not being able to find any person amongst my acquaintance that agreed with me in points of religion, or in scriptural language, that would shew me any good. I was much dejected, and knew not where to seek relief. However, I first frequented the neighboring churches, St. James's and others, two or three times a day, for many weeks. Still I came away dissatisfied, something was wanting that I could not obtain, and I really found more heartfelt relief in reading my Bible at home than it had done in attending the church. And being resolved to be saved, I pursued other methods still. First I went among the Quakers, where the word of God was neither read or preached, so that I remained as much in the dark as ever. Then I searched into the Roman Catholic principles, but was not in the least satisfied. At length I had recourse to the Jews, which availed me nothing, for the fear of eternity daily harassed my mind, and I knew not where to seek shelter from the wrath to come. However, this was my conclusion at all events. To read the four evangelists, and whatever sect or party I found adhering thereto, such I would join. Thus I went on heavily, without any guide to direct me the way that leadeth to eternal life. I asked different people questions about the manner of going to heaven, and was told different ways. Here I was much staggered, I could not find any at the time more righteous than myself, or indeed so much inclined to devotion. I thought that we should not all be saved, this is agreeable to the Holy Scriptures, nor would all be damned. I found none among the circle of my acquaintance that kept holy the Ten Commandments. So righteous was I in my own eyes, that I was convinced I excelled many of them in that point by keeping eight out of ten, and finding those who in general term themselves Christians not so honest or so good in their morals as the Turks. I really thought the Turks were in a safer way of salvation than my neighbors. So that between hopes and fears I went on, and the chief comforts I enjoyed were in the musical French horn, which I then practiced, and also dressing of hair. Such was my situation some months, experiencing the dishonesty of many people here. I determined at last to set out for Turkey, and there to end my days. It was now early in the spring, 1774. I sought for a master, and found the captain John Hughes, commander of a ship called Anglicania, fitting out in the river Thames, and bound to Smyrna in Turkey. I shipped myself with him as a steward. At the same time I recommended to him a very clever black man, John Annis, as a cook. This man was on board the ship nearly two months doing his duty. He had formerly lived many years with Mr. William Kirkpatrick, a gentleman on the island of St. Kitts from whom he parted by consent, though he afterwards tried many schemes to inveigle the poor man. 
He had applied to many captains who traded to St. Kitts to repan him, and when all their attempts and schemes of kidnapping proved abortive, Mr. Kirkpatrick came to our ship at Union Stairs on Easter Monday, April the 4th, with two wherry boats and six men, having learned that the man was on board, and tied and forcibly took him away from the ship in the presence of the crew and the chief mate, who had detained him after he had noticed to come away. I believe that this was a combined piece of business, but at any rate it reflected great disgrace on the mate and captain also, who, although they had desired the oppressed man to stay on board, yet he did not in the least assist to recover him, or pay me a farthing of his wages, which was about five pounds. I proved the only friend he had, who attempted to regain him his liberty if possible, having known the want of liberty myself. I sent as soon as I could to Gravesend, and got knowledge of the ship in which he was, but unluckily she had sailed the first tide after he was put on board. My intention was then immediately to apprehend Mr. Kirkpatrick, who was about setting off for Scotland, and having obtained the habeas corpus for him, and got a tip staff to go with me to St. Paul's churchyard, where he lived, he, suspecting something of this kind, set a watch to look out. My being known to them occasioned me to use the following deception. I whitened my face, that they might not know me, and this had its desired effect. He did not go out of his house that night, and the next morning I contrived a well-plotted stratagem, notwithstanding he had a gentleman in his house to personate him. My direction to the tip staff, who got admittance into the house, was to conduct him to a judge, according to the writ. When he came there, his plea was that he had not the body in custody on which he was admitted to bail. I proceeded immediately to that philanthropist, Granville Sharp, Esquire, who received me with the utmost kindness and gave me every instruction that was needful on the occasion. I left him in full hope that I should gain the unhappy man his liberty, with the warmest sense of gratitude towards Mr. Sharp for his kindness. But alas, my attorney proved unfaithful. He took my money, lost me many months' employ, I did not do the least good in the cause, and when the poor man arrived at St. Kitts, he was, according to custom, staked to the ground with four pins through a cord, two on his wrists and two on his ankles, was cut and flogged most unmercifully, and afterwards loaded cruelly with irons about his neck. I had two very moving letters from him while he was in this situation, and also was told of it by some very respectable families now in London, who saw him in St. Kitts, in the same state in which he remained till death kindly released him out of the hands of his tyrants. During this disagreeable business I was under strong convictions of sin, and thought that my state was worse than any man's. My mind was unaccountably disturbed, I often wished for death, though at the same time convinced I was altogether unprepared for that awful summons. Suffering much by villains in the late course, and being much concerned about the state of my soul, these things, but particularly the latter, brought me very low, so that I became burdened to myself, and viewed all things around me as emptiness and vanity, which could give no satisfaction to a troubled conscience. I was again determined to go to Turkey, and resolved at that time never more to return to England. I engaged a steward on board a Turkey man, the Wester Hall, Captain Lina, but was prevented by means of my late captain, Mr. Hughes, and others. All this appeared to be against me, and the only comfort I then experienced was in reading the Holy Scriptures, where I saw that there is no new thing under the sun, and what was appointed for me I must submit to. Thus I continued to travel in much heaviness, and frequently murmured against the Almighty, particularly in his providential dealings. And awful to think, I began to blaspheme, and wished often to be anything but a human being. In these severe conflicts the Lord answered me by awful visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men in slumberings upon the bed. Job 33.15 He was pleased, in much mercy, to give me to see, and in some measure to understand, the great and awful scene of Judgment Day, that no unclean person, no unholy thing can enter into the kingdom of God. Ephesians 5.5 5. I would then, if it had been possible, have changed my nature with the meanest worm of the earth, and was ready to say to the mountains and rocks, Fall on me, Revelation 6.16, but all in vain. 
I then requested the Divine Creator that he would grant me a small space of time to repent of my follies and vile iniquities, which I felt were grievous. The Lord, in his manifold mercies, was pleased to grant my request, and being yet in a state of time, and the sense of God's mercies was so great on my mind when I awoke, that my strength entirely failed me for many minutes, and I was exceedingly weak. This was the first spiritual mercy I was ever sensible of, and being on praying ground, as soon as I recovered a little strength and got out of bed and dressed myself, I invoked heaven from my inmost soul and fervently begged that God would never again permit me to blaspheme his most holy name. The Lord, who is long-suffering and full of compassion to such poor rebels as we are, condescended to hear an answer. I felt that I was altogether unholy, and saw clearly what a bad use I had made of the faculties I was endowed with. They were given me to glorify God with, I thought. Therefore, I had better want them here and enter into life eternal, than abuse them and be cast into hellfire. I prayed to be directed, if there were any holier than those with whom I was acquainted, that the Lord would point them out to me. I appealed to the searcher of hearts, whether I did not wish to love him more and serve him better. Notwithstanding all this, the reader may easily discern, if he is a believer, that I was still in nature's darkness. At length I hated the house in which I lodged, because God's most holy name was blasphemed in it. Then I saw the word of God verified, viz. Before they call I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. I had a great desire to read the Bible the whole day at home, but not having a convenient place for retirement, I left the house in the day rather than stay among the wicked ones. And that day, as I was walking, it pleased God to direct me to a house where there was an old seafaring man who experienced much of the love of God shed abroad in his heart. He began to discourse with me, and, as I desired to love the Lord, his conversation rejoiced me greatly, and indeed I have never before heard the love of Christ to believers set forth in such a manner and in so clear a point of view. Here I had more questions to put the man than his time would permit him to answer, and in that memorable hour there came in a dissenting minister. He joined our discourse and asked me some few questions, amongst others, where I heard the gospel preached. I knew not what he meant by hearing the gospel. I told him I had read the gospel, and he asked where I went to church, or whether I went at all or not, to which I replied, I attended St. James's, St. Martin's, and St. Anne's, so ho. So, said he, you're a churchman. I answered, I was. He then invited me to a love feast at his chapel that evening. I accepted the offer and thanked him, and soon after he went away. I had some further discourse with the old Christian, added to some profitable reading, which made me exceedingly happy. When I left him, he reminded me of coming to the feast. I assured him I would be there. Thus we parted, and I waked over the heavenly conversation that had passed between these two men, which cheered my then heavy and drooping spirit more than anything I had met with for many months. However, I thought the time long in going to my supposed banquet. I also wished for the company of these friendly men. Their company pleased me much, and I thought the gentlemen very kind in asking me, a stranger, to a feast. But how singular did it appear to me to have it in a chapel! When the wished-for hour came, I went, and happily the old man was there, who kindly seated me, as he belonged to the place. I was much astonished to see the place filled with people, and no signs of eating and drinking. There were many ministers in the company. At last they began by giving out hymns, and between the singing the minister engaged in prayer. In short, I knew not what to make of this sight, having never seen anything of the kind in my life before now. Some of the guests began to speak their experience agreeable to what I read in the scriptures. Much was said by every speaker of the providence of God and his unspeakable mercies to each of them. This I knew in a great measure and could most heartily join them. But when they spoke of a future state, they seemed to be altogether certain of their calling and election of God and that no one could ever separate them from the love of Christ or pluck them out of his hands. This filled me with utter consternation, intermingled with admiration. I was so amazed as not to know what to think of the company. My heart was attracted and my affections were enlarged. I wished to be as happy as them, and thus persuaded in my mind that they were different from the world that lieth in wickedness. 
First John 5.19 Their language and singing, etc. did well harmonize, and I was entirely overcome, and wished to live and die thus. Lastly, some persons in the place produced some neat baskets full of buns, which they distributed about, and each person communicated with his neighbor, and sipped water out of different mugs, which they handed about to all who were present. This kind of Christian fellowship I had never seen, nor ever thought of seeing on earth. It fully reminded me of what I read in the Holy Scriptures, of the primitive Christians who loved each other and broke bread. In partaking of it, even from house to house, this entertainment, which lasted about four hours, ended in singing and prayer. It was the first soul feast I was ever present at. This last 24 hours produced me things spiritual and temporal, sleeping and waking, judgment and mercy, that I could not but admire the goodness of God in directing the blind, blasphemous sinner in the path that he knew not of, even among the just. And instead of judgment, he had shewed mercy and will hear and answer the prayers and supplications of every t- returning prodigal. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor! Daily I am constrained to be. After this, I was resolved to win heaven if possible, and if I perished, I thought that I should be at the feet of Jesus in praying to him for salvation. After having been an eyewitness to some of the happiness which attended those who feared God, I knew not how, with any propriety, to return to my lodgings, where the name of God was continually profaned, at which I felt the greatest horror. I paused in my mind for some time, not knowing what to do, whether to hire a bed elsewhere or go home again. At last, fearing an evil report might arise, I went home with a farewell to card playing and vain jesting, etc. I saw that time was very short, eternity long, and very near, and I viewed those persons alone blessed who were found really at midnight call, or when the judge of all, both quick and dead, cometh. The next day I took courage and went to Holborn to see my new and worthy acquaintance, the old man, Mr. C. He, with his wife, a gracious woman, were at work at silk weaving. They seemed mutually happy and both quite glad to see me, and I more so to see them. I sat down and we conversed much about soul matters, etc. The discourse was amazingly delightful, edifying and pleasant. I knew not at last how to leave this agreeable pair till time summoned me away. As I was going, they lent me a little book entitled The Conversion of an Indian. It was in questions and answers. The poor man came over the sea to London to inquire after the Christian's God, who, through rich mercy, had found and had not his journey in vain. The above book was of great use to me, and at the time was a means of strengthening my faith. However, in parting, the boat invited me to call on them when I pleased. This delighted me, and I took care to make all improvement from it I could, and so far I thanked God for such company and desires. I prayed that the many evils I felt within me might be gone away, and that I might be weaned from my foreigner carnal acquaintances. This was quickly heard and answered, and I was soon connected with those whom the scripture calls the excellent of the earth. I heard the gospel preached, and the thoughts of my heart and actions were laid open by the preachers, and the way of salvation by Christ alone was evidently set forth. Thus I went on happily for near two months, And I once heard, during this period, a reverend gentleman speak of a man who had departed this life in full assurance of his going to glory. I was much astonished at the assertion, and did very deliberately inquire how he could get at this knowledge. I was answered fully, agreeable to what I read in the oracles of truth, and was told also that if I did not experience the new birth and the pardon of my sins through the blood of Christ before I died, I could not enter the kingdom of heaven. I knew not what to think of this report. As I thought, I kept eight commandments out of ten. Then my worthy interpreter told me I did not do so, nor could I, and he added that no man ever did or could keep the commandments without offending in one point. I thought this sounded very strange and puzzled me for many weeks, for I thought it a hard saying. I then asked my friend, Mr. L., who was a clerk in a chapel, why the commandments of God were given if we could not be saved by them? To which he replied, 
The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, who alone could and did keep the commandments, and fulfilled all the requirements for his elect people, even those to whom he had given a living faith. And the sins of those chosen vessels were already atoned for and forgiven them whilst living. And if I did not experience the same before my exit, the Lord would say at the great day to me, Go ye cursed, etc., etc. For God would appear faithful in his judgments to the wicked, as he would be faithful in shewing mercy to those who are ordained to it before the world was. Therefore Christ Jesus seemed to be all in all to that man's soul. I was much wounded at this discourse, and brought into such a dilemma as I never expected. I asked him, if he was to die that moment, whether he was sure to enter the kingdom of God, and added, Do you know that your sins are forgiven you? He answered in the affirmative. Then confusion, anger, and discontent seized me, and I staggered much at this sort of doctrine. It brought me to a stand, not knowing which to believe, whether salvation by works or by faith only in Christ. I requested him to tell me how I might know when my sins were forgiven me. He assured me he could not and that none by God alone could do this. I told him it was very mysterious, but he said it was really matter of fact, and quoted many portions of scripture immediately to the point to which I could make no reply. He then desired to pray to God to shew me these things. I answered that I prayed to God every day. He said, I perceive you are a churchman. I answered I was. He then entreated me to beg of God to shew me what I was and the true state of my soul. I thought the prayer very short and long, so we parted for that time. I weighed all these things well over and could not help thinking how it was possible for a man to know that his sins were forgiven him in this life. I wished that God would reveal this self same thing unto me. In a short time after this I went to Westminster Chapel. The Reverend Mr. P preached. It was a wonderful sermon. He clearly showed that every living man had no cause to complain for the punishment of his sins. He evidently justified the Lord in all his dealings with the Son of Man. He also showed the justice of God in the eternal punishment of the wicked and impenitent. The discourse seemed to me like a two-edged sword, cutting all ways. It afforded me much joy, intermingled with many fears about my soul. And when it was ended, he gave it out that he intended the ensuing week to examine all those who meant to attend the Lord's table. Now I thought much of my good works, and at the same time was doubtful of my being a proper object to receive the sacraments. I was full of meditation till the day of examining. However, I went to the chapel, and, though much distressed, I addressed the reverend gentleman, thinking, if I was not right, he would endeavor to convince me of me. When I conversed with him, the first thing he asked me was what I know of Christ. I told him I believed in him and had been baptized in his name. Then, said he, When were you brought to the knowledge of God, and how were you convinced of sin? I knew not what he meant by these questions. I told him I kept eight commandments out of ten, but that I sometimes swore on board a ship, and sometimes went on shore, and broke the Sabbath. He then asked me if I could read. I answered, Yes. Then, said he, Do you not read the Bible? He that offends in one point is guilty of all. I said, yes. He then assured me that one sin unatoned for was as sufficient to damn a soul as one leak was to sink a ship. Here I was struck with awe, for the minister exhorted me much and reminded me of the shortness of time and the length of eternity and that no unregenerate soul or anything unclear could enter the kingdom of heaven. He did not admit me as a communicant, but recommended me to read the scriptures and hear the word preached, not to neglect fervent prayer to God, who had promised to hear the supplications of those who seek him in godly sincerity. So I took my leave of him, with many thanks, and resolved to follow his advice, so far as the Lord would condescend to enable me. During this time, I was out of employ, nor was I likely to get a situation suitable for me, which obliged me to go once more to sea. I engaged the steward of a ship called Hope, Captain Richard Strange, bound from London to Cadiz in Spain. In a short time after I was on board, I heard the name of God much blasphemed, and I feared greatly lest I should catch the horrible infection. 
I thought if I sinned again, after having life and death set evidently before me, I should certainly go to hell. My mind was uncommonly chagrined, and I murmured much at God's providential dealings with me, and was discontented with the commandments that I could not be saved by what I had done. I hated all things, and wished I had never been born. Confusion seized me, and I wished to be annihilated. One day I was standing on the very edge of the stern of the ship, thinking to drown myself. But this scripture was instantly impressed on my mind, that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. 1 John 3.15 Then I paused, and I thought myself the unhappiest man living. Again I was convinced that the Lord was better to me than I deserved, and I was better off in the world than many. After this I began to fear death. I fretted, mourned, and prayed, till I became a burden to others, but more so to myself. At length I concluded to beg my bread on shore, rather than go again to sea among a people who feared not God, and entreated the captain three different times to discharge me. He would not, but each time gave me greater and greater encouragement to continue with him, and all on board shewed me a very great civility. Notwithstanding all this, I was unwilling to embark again. At last, some of my religious friends advised me by saying it was my lawful calling, consequently it was my duty to obey, and that God was not confined to place, etc., etc. Particularly Mr. G. S., the government of Tothill Fields Bridewell, who pitied my case and read the 11th chapter of the Hebrews to me with exhortations. He prayed for me, and I believed that he prevailed on my behalf, as my burden was then greatly removed, and I found a heartfelt resignation to the will of God. The good man gave me a pocket Bible and Alan's alarm to the unconvented. We parted, and the next day I went on board again. We sailed for Spain, and I found favor with the captain. It was the 4th of the month of September when we sailed from London. We had a delightful voyage to Cadiz, where we arrived the 23rd of the same month. The place is strong, commands a fine prospect, and is very rich. The Spanish galloons frequent that port, and some arrived whilst we were there. I had many opportunities of reading the scriptures. I wrestled hard with God in fervent prayer, who had declared in his word that he would hear the groanings and deep sighs of the poor in spirit. I found this verified to my utter astonishment and comfort in the following manner. On the morning of the 6th of October, I prayed to you to attend, or all that day, I thought that I should either see or hear something supernatural. I had a secret impulse on my mind of something that was to take place, which drove me continually for that time to a throne of grace. It pleased God to enable me to wrestle with him, as Jacob did. I prayed that if sudden death were to happen, and I perished, it might be at Christ's feet. In the evening of the same day, as I was reading and meditating on the fourth chapter of the Acts 12th verse, under the solemn apprehensions of eternity and reflecting on my past actions, I began to think that I had lived a moral life, and that I had a proper ground to believe I had an interest in the divine favor. But still meditating on the subject, not knowing whether salvation was to be had partly for our own good deeds, or solely as the sovereign gift of God, in this deep consternation the Lord was pleased to break in upon my soul with the bright beams of heavenly light, and, in an instant, as it were, removing the veil and letting light into a dark place, I saw clearly with the eye of faith the crucified Saviour bleeding on the cross on Mount Calvary. The scriptures became an unsealed book. I saw myself a condemned criminal under the law, which came with its full force to my conscience, and when the commandments came sin revived and I died, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ in his humiliation, loaded and bearing my reproach, sin and shame. I then clearly perceived that by the deeds of the law no living flesh could be justified. I was then convinced that by the first Adam sin came, and by the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, all that are saved must be made alive. It was given me at that time to know what it was to be born again. John 3, 5 I saw the 8th chapter to the Romans, and the doctrines of God's decrees, verified agreeable to his eternal, everlasting, and unchangeable purposes. The word of God was sweet to my taste, yes, sweeter than honey and honeycomb. Christ was revealed to my soul as the chiefest among ten thousand. 
these heavenly moments were really as life to the dead and what John calls an earnest of the spirit. This was indeed unspeakable and I firmly believe undeniable by many. Now every leading providential circumstance that happened to me from the day I was taken from my parents to that hour was then in my view as if it had been just then occurred. I was sensible of the invisible hand of God which guided and protected me when in truth I knew it not. Still the Lord pursued me, although I slighted and disregarded it. This mercy melted me down. When I considered my poor wretched state, I wept, seeing what a great debtor I was to a sovereign free grace. Now the Ethiopian was willing to be saved by Jesus Christ, the sinner's only surety, and also to rely on none other person or thing for salvation. Self was obnoxious, and good works he had none, for it is God that worketh in us, both to will and to do. The amazing things of that hour can never be told. It was joy in the Holy Ghost. I felt an astonishing change. The burden of sin, the gaping jaws of hell, and the fears of death that weighed me down before now lost their horror. Indeed, I thought death would now be the best earthly friend I ever had. Such were my grief and joy, as I believe are seldom experienced. I was bathed in tears, and saw, What am I that God should thus look on me, the vilest of sinners? I felt a deep concern for my mother and friends, which occasioned me to pray with fresh ardor, and in the abyss of thought I viewed the unconverted people of the world in a very awful state, being without God and without hope. It pleased God to pour out on me the spirit of prayer and the grace of supplication, so that in loud acclamations I was enabled to praise and glorify his most holy name. When I got out of the cabin and told some of the people what the Lord had done for me, alas, who could understand me or believe my report? None but to whom the arm of the Lord was revealed. I became a barbarian to them in talking of the love of Christ. His name was to me as ointment poured forth. Indeed, it was sweet to my soul, but to them a rock of offense. I thought my case singular, and every hour a day until I came to London, for I much longed to be with some to whom I could tell the wonders of God's love towards me, and join in prayer to him whom my soul loved and thirsted after. I had uncommon commotions within, such as few can tell aught about. Now the Bible was my only companion and comfort. I prized it much, with many thanks to God that I could read it for myself, and was not left to be tossed about or led by man's devices and notions. The worth of a soul cannot be told. May the Lord give the reader an understanding in this. Whenever I looked in the Bible I saw things new, and many texts were immediately applied to me with great comfort, for I knew that to me was the word of salvation sent. Sure I was that the Spirit, which indicted the word, opened my heart to receive the truth as it is in Jesus, that the same Spirit enabled me to act faith upon the promises that were so precious to me and enabled me to believe in the salvation of my soul. By free grace I was persuaded that I had a part in the first resurrection and was enlightened with the light of the living, Job 33.30. I wished for a man of God with whom I might conserve. I wished for a man of God with whom I might converse. My soul was like the chariots of Aminidab, Canticles 6.12. These, amongst others, were the precious promises that were so powerfully applied to me. All things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Matthew 21.22 Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. John 1427. I thought the blessed Redeemer to be the fountain of life and the well of salvation. I experienced him in all. He had brought me by a way that I knew not, and he had made crooked paths straight. Then in his name I set up my Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto he has helped me, and could say to the sinner about me, Behold what a Saviour I have. Thus I was, by the teaching of that all-glorious deity, the great one in three and three in one, confirmed in the truths of the Bible, those oracles of everlasting truth, on which every soul living must stand or fall eternally, agreeable to Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for
for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved but only Christ Jesus. May God give the reader a right understanding in these facts. To him that believeth all things are possible, but to them that are unbelieving nothing is pure. Titus 1.15 During this period we remained at Cadiz until our ship got laden. We sailed about the 4th of November and having a good passage we arrived in London the month following to my comfort with heartfelt gratitude to God for his rich and unspeakable mercies. On my return I had but one text which puzzled me or that the devil endeavoured to buffet me with viz. Romans 11.6 and as I had heard of of the Reverend Mr. Romain and his great knowledge in the scriptures, I wished much to hear him preach. One day I went to Blackfriars Church, and to my great satisfaction and surprise, he preached from that very text. He very clearly shewed the difference between human works and free election, which is according to God's sovereign will and pleasure. These glad tidings set me entirely at liberty, and I went out of the church rejoicing seeing my spots were those of God's children. I went to Westminster Chapel and saw some of my old friends who were glad when they perceived the wonderful change that the Lord had wrought in me, particularly Mr. G, my worthy acquaintance, who was a man of a joyous spirit and with great zeal for the Lord's service. I enjoyed his correspondence till he died in the year 1784. I was again examined at the same chapel, and was received into church fellowship amongst them. I rejoiced in spirit, making melody in my heart to the God of all mercies. Now my whole wish was to be dissolved and to be with Christ, but alas, I must wait mine appointed time. Reflections on the state of my mind during my first convictions of the necessity of believing the truth and experiencing the inestimable benefits of Christianity. Well may I say my life has been one scene of sorrow and of pain. From early days I griefs have known, and as I grew my griefs have grown. Dangers were always in my path, and fears of wrath and sometimes death. While pale dejection in me reigned, I often wept by grief constrained. When taken from my native land by an unjust and cruel band, how did uncommon dread prevail? My sighs no more I could conceal. To ease my mind I often strove, and tried my trouble to remove. I sung and uttered sighs between, essayed to stifle guilt with sin. But, oh, not all that I could do would stop the current of my woo. Conviction still my vileness shewed, how great my guilt, how lost from God. Prevented that I could not die, nor might just to one kind refuge fly, an orphan state I had to mourn forsook by all, and left forlorn. Those who beheld my downcast mien could not guess at my woes unseen. They by appearances could not know the troubles that I waded through. Last anger, blasphemy, and pride, with legions of such ills beside, troubled my thoughts while doubt and fears clouded and darkened most my years. Sighs now no more would be confined. They breathed the trouble of my mind. I wished for death, but checked the word, and often prayed unto the Lord. Unhappy more than some on earth, I thought the place that gave me birth. Strange thoughts oppressed, while I replied, Why not in Ethiopia died? And why thus spared nigh to hell? God only knew, I could not tell. A tottering fence, a bowing wall, taught myself ere since the fall. Of times I mused, and I despair, while birds melodious filled the air. Thrice happy songsters ever free, how blessed were they compared to me? Thus all things added to my pain, while grief compelled me to complain. When sable clouds began to rise, my mind grew darker than the skies. The English nation called to leave, how did my breast with sorrows heave? I longed for rest, cried, help me, Lord, some mitigation, Lord, afford. Yet on dejected still I went, heart-throbbing woes within were pent. No land nor sea could comfort give, nothing my anxious mind relieve. Weary with travail yet unknown, to all but God and self alone, numerous months for peace I strove, and numerous foes I had to prove. Inured to dangers, griefs, and woes, trained up midst perils, deaths, and foes, 
I said, must it thus ever be? No quiet is permitted me. Hard hap and more than heavy lot, I prayed to God, forget me not. What though ordained willing I'll bear, but oh, deliver from despair. Strivings and wrestlings seemed in vain, nothing I did could ease my pain. Then gave I up my works and will, confessed and owned my doom was hell. Like some poor prisoner at the bar, conscious of guilt, of sin and fear, Arraigned and self-condemned I stood, lost in the world and in my blood. Yet here, midst blackest clouds confined, a beam from Christ the day star shined. Surely, thought I, if Jesus please, he can at once sign my release. I, ignorant of his righteousness, set up my labors in its place, forgot for why his blood was shed, and prayed and fasted in its stead. He died for sinners, I am one. Might not his blood for me atone, though I am nothing else but sin, yet surely he can make me clean. Thus light came in, and I believed, myself forgot, and help perceived. My Saviour then I knew I found, for reasoned from guilt, no more I groaned. O happy hour, in which I ceased to mourn, for then I found a rest. My soul and Christ were now as one, thy light, O Jesus, in me shone. Blessed be thy name, for now I know. I and my works can nothing do, the Lord alone can ransom man, for this the spotless lamp was slain. When sacrifices, works, and prayer proved vain and ineffectual were, lo, then I come, the Saviour cried, and bleeding bowed his head and died. He died for all who ever saw, no help in them, nor by the law. I this have seen, and gladly own, salvation is by Christ alone. End of chapter 10. Recording by Monsbru. Helsingfors, Finland.